long-awaited new episode. Yes. Um, um, we should have chosen. Long-awaited in the sense that it's been a minute since we've done an actual movie. Yeah. And yeah. it's also long-awaited in that it's been a while. Actually, been a minute since this movie came out, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, this one. Was it's this technically a 2022 movie. It's hard to tell because IMDb lists it as a 2022. But it wasn't available anywhere. Yeah, but it wasn't available. I didn't see trailers for it until 2023. So when that happens, I qualified as a 2023 movie. Okay. That's just that's how my counting goes. And what you say goes. Yeah, it's our podcast. We make the rules. You are the dictator of Drive Home Review World. That's right. It's um, a small kingdom, but. <laughs> um. So, but. I have a feeling it was maybe released in Ireland first. It did seem very Irish. Because I think a lot of Irish actors, a lot, I think the director's Irish, I have a feeling. Right. Um, um, but <laughs> I, I have a little bit of a spoiler for the, the review that's going to come later. <laughs> um, we decided to talk about movies that are disappointing. Yes, and just, well first of all, before we get to that, I think it's important, what do you classify as a disappointment? Like how do you... Well, see, I feel like most of my movie disappointments come from book um, adaptations so okay I would say mainly stories that you know I had envisioned in one way and just completely went the other way or that have completely changed themselves from the like they didn't change in themselves they were changed completely from the plot of the book so something that's not loyal to the source material sure okay um, also, I would account for things that you would expect to be good because they contain a lot of good actors in them. Yeah. And are just complete bombs. I'd put Queen Bees in that toy. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think different people define what a disappointment is differently. Um, like the films that I, I remember I had this conversation with Matt a couple times and he would say that you know this such and such movie didn't disappoint him because he didn't expect anything from it okay like and so if it delivers even slightly that it's exceeded his expectations okay um, I'm a little different I certain things I expect to be good right as you said just due to the uh, the lineage, the creative personalities involved, and when they fall flat, there's this big kind of, well, how did this happen? You know, but like, for instance, I've never been disappointed in any of the DC movies, because I never expected any of them to be good. Oh, see, I was disappointed in them. As I, I could tell from the trailers and looking at them, like, this is going to be crap. Okay, so basically something that you got excited for mm -hmm. and then just completely failed to live up to your, your expectations. Yeah, exactly. All right. So that, that's kind of how I, I define a theatrical disappointment. All right. Okay, so what, what kind of movie would you put in there? Well, I can, I can tell you one right now, and you, you remember this one. We might do this for the next retro review when we need it. Um, uh, the last James Bond movie. Oh my god. No Time to Die. What a yes. what an absolute disappointment in every sh meaning of the word. Yeah, and I think more for you than for me because um, I haven't been a huge fan of the Daniel Craig Bonds. I thought he was too overly emotional. Too, it was they were trying to pull the whole dark anti-hero Christian Bale as Batman thing mm -hmm. um, with James Bond, and I just felt like that was the opposite to what the James Bond franchise was. See, you know, what's interesting about that comment, and I'm not disagreeing with you at all, but what's interesting is one of the things you said earlier was that what classifies as a disappointment to you are things that stray from the source material. Right. But the Daniel Craig, at least Casino Royale, is closer to the original Ian Fleming Bond well, than any of the previous ones, with maybe sure. the exception of early Sean Connery or Timothy Dalton. Right, but then it doesn't follow the evolution of Bond. And I, th I think that's fair. I think that's where it's interesting is that there is a difference between the books and the movies. And I think at a certain point, the movie be 
becomes the standard. Right. You know, kind of like I, kind of like Mary Poppins. Like when people think Mary Poppins, I think very few people these days think the book. book. Right. They think the Disney movie. That's the that's the standard for them. Yeah. So I can I can understand that, but it was also disappointing for you, um, more so because you had been a. Daniel Craig apologist. <laughs> I, I will still defend and I will still say that Casino Royale and Skyfall are genuinely good Bond movies. Different from their predecessors, right. but still genuinely good outings. Quantum of Solace was okay, but the writer's strike like uh, did that one in. Uh, Spectre was a complete waste. Right. Do you know what made me more disappointed, too, in Daniel Craig was when I saw him in the Knives Out movies. Mm -hmm. Because it was like, you can be that charming. Yeah. You can be that affable and charismatic. And they just didn't play on that. I felt like they just did not take advantage of his, his... Charisma? Yes. I can agree with that. So, But we can both agree that the last James Bond movie was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and so, so, kind of like Spectre, so, so boring. Oh, yeah. It was so dull. There's one good scene in it. I can forgive a lot, but boring. Yeah, like, there was one really great scene where I thought, okay, this is picking up, and then the character that helped make it energetic left, and it was like, oh, well, I guess we're done with that now. Yeah. Kind of like cool meaning in this one. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> All right, so what's a, what's a disappointment for you? Um, for me, I would have to say uh, the movie version of Divergent. Really? Yes, because um, when I read the books, the character, the characters in the books were so strong, and the storyline was so strong, and then there was this afterthought of a love story, you know, of a romantic connection, and the the movie just made it seem like all of her actions came from this attraction to a boy. Mm. And it just completely changed the feeling of the book totally. Plus it didn't get into one of the things that made the books so rich were the different um, factions and like going into the history of the different factions and why like they were set up the way they were. Mm. So it just completely lost its its charm. I would say the same thing for the Giver movie. Mm. Like the, they were not able to translate the magic of the book into a movie. And I don't think they ha they I don't think there is a way that they could do that. So all it is is a big disappointment with Jeff Bridges who I love. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, now, here's an interesting one, because I think this is where I fall a lot. Um, is there something that the general populace, the you know, pop culture, internet culture, social media culture, or whatever, has declared a disappointment that you actually really like? Oh, gosh. I'll have to think about that for a second. Because it feels like I am more on that fringe group than, you know... There's a lot of things that have come out that people have declared just the worst thing ever. And I'm like, I don't see it being that bad. Hmm. You know? Like, uh, while you're thinking, I'll throw out one. And I know I'm going to get hate comments for this. Because um, I've already gotten hate <laughs> comments with. I do not think the last season of Game of Thrones was that bad. <laughs> like, to the level that people are still venomously angry about it. It's like, it's not... Yeah, I think maybe it could have been expanded. They should have done a longer season, or I think certain events should have been juxtaposed. But I'm not disappointed with how it came out, with who lived, who died, who ended up ruling. Like, it, it, it all made sense within the world of the show to me. But people just have been on this thing since like the first episode almost really yeah and it's like i understand it not living up to your expectations but 
and like I said, there are there is criticism I can give it, but it's like it's not this crime against humanity people seem to be painting it as. <laughs> well, I would go the opposite of that with the uh, season finale or series finale of Friends. Really? Yes, everybody loves that that Rachel gets off the plane and goes with Ross, and I don't know if it's because I'm a feminist or if it's because. I think Ross is kind of a dick, or if, if uh, it's because I have daughters. But the <laughs> idea that she gives up her dream job in Paris to stay with this gelled haired, self centered, narcissist, barely employed paleontologist that has jerked her around all over the place, cheated on her once, has a history of lying to her, and she's going to give up her dream job in Paris to be with him. I'm sorry, no. Okay? So, yeah. And what's what's I, even worse about that? Because I'm not a, I am not a Friends fan in the slightest. You are not. But you what, tolerate it for, for our daughter. I thing, do. But. Um, but what I find even funnier about that is that he, Ross, at the time, was classified as the good guy. Right, the nice guy. That was the, that was the trope that he fell into. And, yeah, as I think a lot of people are rediscovering that now, watching it and going... He is not. He is in no way, shape, or form a nice guy. Nope. Kind of like Ted Mosby on How I Met Your Mother. They always classified him as, oh, you're such you're a great guy, Ted. No. No, he is fucking not. Look it's at that show. Nice guy in quotation marks. Yeah, it's like, no, he is actually a terrible human being. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I would, yeah, I would put that in that place. On the other hand, like... Um, Parks and Rec got a lot of heat for their last season because they kind of jumped forward into the future. And, yeah. Um, and I thought it was kind of brilliant because you really got to see the advancement of these characters. Um, so I I would put that in my in my uh, we rewatch that one once a year. Yeah. Have you uh -huh. have you ever had one that okay this is hard I don't know if I'm describing this right where you were disappointed in it but. N you were disappointed in it because it meant you had to be in agreement with people you really hate. Oh, yes. So, like, um, when Seth MacFarlane does something that's actually funny. <laughs> yes. Like, I would say... As a huge Seth MacFarlane fan, I'm going to say, ouch, but okay, I, I get it. That's fair. It's a fair yes. statement. Well, you know this is one of our areas. It is. It is. Uh, I think Seth MacFarlane is completely full of himself. He I is. Can, I can, on, on the outside, I can say, hey, um, I understand what he's doing and I can appreciate what he's creating, but the actual work that he creates, I'm like, not for me. Okay. But I did enjoy the episodes that I watched of The Orvo. <laughs> So, and he's like prominent in that. He acts in that and he's, he's the creator. So, like, I don't know. Like, I I will watch episodes of them but begrudgingly enjoy them. Okay. And it's not that I hate Seth MacFarlane fans. I hate Seth MacFarlane. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you? Um, The last Star Wars movie. Oh. The, the Rise of Skywalker. I was so disappointed in it, and what disappointed me is it meant I was in agreement with Star Wars with, fanboys. With Star Wars toxic ass fanboys, despite the fact, or compounded by the fact that most of the reasons why that movie sucked was because of them. <laughs> because they made such a fuss about The Last Jedi, which I will still say was a good movie. That they went and retconned everything. Yeah, and so this last chapter is a mess that makes no sense no. but you know uh oh they don't like that Asian girl we better get rid of her because we don't want to offend the, the gatekeeper fanboys yeah you know it's see I would I would have to say that maybe that area is one that does not disappoint me that I'm in it just I think Kylo Ren was a great character <laughs> I thought that his death was great. I thought that his whole storyline was great. I loved Kylo Ren as a character. He's like put Adam Driver in the zeitgeist for me. Yeah, I just, it's, 
Yeah, like, I, I, we had this conversation with some friends of ours not too long ago that I, I, I can't qualify myself as a Star Wars fan anymore because I, I can't stand Star Wars fans. Right. It's not even the product I mind so much. It's the fan base yeah. that I, I just can't. And so I was so disappointed. I remember doing the review for that one and just like, I have to give this a bad review. And it means that, that, that I have to be at least surfacely in agreement with these douchebags. Yep. And I, I hate that. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. It's okay. It happens. Uh, well, I think it is uh, sufficient to say that these are examples that pale in comparison to the disappointment that we are going to be talking about. Yeah. Yeah. This and is this one. And kind of like you were saying, not only did this come out a while ago. But I've been I've been looking forward to it. You bought the DVD before you even because like, watched it. I love those you know those old detective the dime store detectives the yeah. you know the radio show detectives and so and I was like all right Liam gonna, Neeson that's perfect. It's like okay I'm I'm looking forward to this and I think it would I think it does not uh, I th I would say this does not fall into his special set of skills. No, it does. It does not. Yes. Or anybody's, from what we could see. Uh, yeah, <laughs> disappointment in so many levels. Anyways, uh, we'll come back to that. Yeah. So yeah, we'll take our traditional break, and uh, yeah, and we will we'll uh, we show ourselves up. I mean, we might need some chocolate, like yeah. when, when the Dementors come. Well, you said you said we needed to watch more bad movies. That's true. Because we're getting towards the end, and we, we need We've stuff. We've just had really good movies this year. 2023 has been a year of good movies. Good to decent. I would say good like, to good. Not, not a lot Not a lot that I would qualify as the worst things ever. Good to so, great, I even. So, so again, this is the, dis the, not the, well, the disagreement that we have. But, yes, we'll take a break, and then we will come back and, uh, and talk about this thing. Oi. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump in with both feet, shall we? <laughs> so the the film that we are talking about today is the latest adaptation of Dime Store Detective Philip Marlowe. Uh, uh, originally played by uh, Humphrey Bogart did it on the on the big screen, of course, in The Big Sleep. Yep. With uh, which is famous for being one of the movies he did with Lauren Lord Bacall. Bacall. I, I think, and I could be wrong about this, I think that's the one that has the line of, you know, you know how to whistle, don't you just put your lips together and blow. Which is a very bad whistle tutorial for those of us <laughs> who don't know how to whistle, because all that does is blow. Yeah. Okay? Um, and this time starring Liam Neeson. Right. Um, you'll be forgiven if you had no idea this movie existed, because it is another one of those that... Um, I saw the trailer on YouTube. Uh, I don't think it ever made it to a theatrical release that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. which means it might have been released in a bigger market, but it feels like it, it hopped on the rocket sled to the direct to streaming. Right. Um, and which, like you said in the, in the intro, it seems as though it was made by an Irish filmmaker and a, with a lot of Irish actors. A lot of Irish and, and Scottish actors, yeah, because it's got... Um, Liam Neeson, of course, got Alan Cummings. Uh, Shauna something is our is one of our actresses, mm -hmm. and then of course Jessica Lange and Diane Kruger are American. But yeah, and and the great Cole Meany. Cole Meany, um, from Star Trek fame. Yeah, so it does feel like this was an Irish production. If I I have no proof of that, but it definitely feels. Um, Feels like it, and uh, but then we don't want to put that on our Irish. No, uh, we don't want to blame that on Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the story is kind of your basic Philip Marlowe. Anybody's kind of familiar with that kind of blonde bombshell walks into a private detective's agency. Starts with a very simple task: find this person for this yeah. reason, and of course, then it all unravels into this much bigger kind of web of 
you know, the, the Marlowe stories, I think, are kind of infamous for their convoluted and hard-to-follow plots. I remember The Big Sleep, a lot of people, even the film critics who love it, say that, yeah, it's very hard to follow. You're not quite sure what happens in it. Right. But the, uh, the Bogart version and, you know, previous incantations did have something that this version does not, and that is interest. <laughs> Look, I will forgive a lot of things. Like I said before, I will forgive a lot of things, even bad acting. But boring in a movie is unforgivable. And that that is the way to describe... You said it, that's probably the title of the video, is that the name of it should have been The Big Sleep. Because yeah. it is so dull. Oh my gosh. And uninteresting. Well, you and... just keep waiting for it to get interesting. Uh -huh. It should be interesting when Alan Cumming is on the screen. Okay. Hamming it up. Like, and it's just not. Yeah, it's, it is a bad sign when you, like I say, you, you're, you're used to a Marlowe story probably going to be a bit convoluted. But if, but you don't necessarily mind that so long as the characters are interesting and or the, engaging. yeah, the directing is, you know, unique or whatever. And I fell out of this one about halfway through. Yeah, you suggested turning it off. Yeah, which I don't normally do. Like, I don't think I've ever heard you suggest that. Like, um, but which we did not. Yeah, we, we stuck it through. We stuck through because we are professional amateur film critics. <laughs> <laughs> with Diane Kruger as the woman who comes in, the client who comes in. Of course she is half his age, and they mention in the film a couple of times for her daddy issues. Liking men twice her age and all that. Um, and of course it's, you know, like I think that I've been reading more stories about this lately. The, uh, the age gap difference between characters and film. It's, a, it's just kind of gross. Mm. You know? But in addition to that, um, there's no chemistry between them. None. About halfway through, Diane Kruger makes a suggestion that then they might sleep together. And you're like, where did that come from? Like, no, there's been no heat, no passion. They've not even connected. They, they threw half-hearted innuendos back and forth. You said that, I thought this was like probably the best way to sum this up, especially in the early goings is that they were leaning so hard on the noir um, uh, tropes and delivery that it felt like a parody. Yes, about, what, a quarter of the way through we looked at each other and went, is this supposed to be a parody? Yeah. And, and no. You, you said you kept waiting for Leslie Nielsen to show up. Yes, like, it <laughs> like, felt like like it was it was so heavy into... Oh gosh, not portraying a character, portraying a trope of a character. Yeah. That, like, it just did not feel genuine at all. And Liam Neeson is a good actor. Yeah, and a charismatic one. And a, like, you could see him filling up the, the Philip Marlowe uh, type, that two fisted, growly, you know, good guy, but in a dark kind of way, you know, type of, type of character. And, at one point, he makes some kind of exclamation that he can't believe somebody did something. And it was like, I don't know, let's say, good God, I can't believe you did that. And literally so monotone, good God, I can't believe you did that. Yeah. Like, what? what? Like, you just said it like you were saying, I'd like a drink beyond rye. Like, nothing. Yeah, it's just, there's... And Jessica Lang is there, and she's great, but she's got nothing. She's playing off of nothing. You know, and their conversations don't make any sense. At one point, they're having a perfectly normal conversation. No one has said anything remotely, you know, um, over the top or untowards. And then one of the characters just stands up and flips the table. Yeah. Like, what? Where did that come from? <laughs> like, no. No, 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 no. I would say the only bright spot was when Cole Meany would come That in. is the only bright spot for me. Like, when he came, I love Cole Meany. Yeah. And he just, he just has a presence about him. Yeah. 
like that, when he's on the screen and anything, you're just like, yeah, it's Cole Meany, it's Chief O'Brien, and I'm all good here. Yeah. You know, and, but it's far too little. It's, it does not, it cannot save the movie. Like, we, I'd love to tell you what the plot was, but I don't know. I it's mean, something to do with the a The guy movie. disappeared and he got ran over, but it wasn't really him. It was this other guy that he knew. And nobody cares about that guy. No, they're like, like oh, well, oh, you just killed that. Okay, fuck him. They, you know. they killed the guy to cover up his murder, like to cut, like to fake his own death, but nobody cares that that guy got killed. Because he, because our, the guy who was supposed to be killed is actually a drug smuggler and he's smuggling heroin, I think. Over the yes. border, inside uh, props for a movie studio or something like that. Which should have been way more interesting than yes. it was. Like, okay, at one point they walk through a bar where women are stripping. And I'm like, I don't even care that there's naked women here. <laughs> okay? Like, it's not even interesting to me anymore. And I think, yeah, and we've got to point at the directing as well as that. It is so flat. And lifeless. Yes. And it is just... all of it. It's not one aspect of this. It is all of it. It is the script. It is the delivery. It is the directing. All of it combined to make the most flat, marshmallow, stale nugget of nothing. See, I wouldn't even call it a marshmallow. Marshmallows, even stale marshmallows, have flavor. <laughs> this did... And my the thing that kept getting me as we're getting through, as we're going through the film. The question that kept coming to my mind is, why was this movie made? Yeah, there was no reason. What, what is the point to this movie being made? Because normally you can understand why a film got made. It got made, ideally, for the people who still think that movies are art, for the Martin Scorsese's of the world. You know, it's because the, the filmmaker had a story to tell. They had something they wanted to point at or a parallel they wanted to draw to modern life or something to that effect. I will tell you why this movie got made. Why is that? Somebody happened upon a storage closet full of old Hollywood props and costumes and was like, we should do something with this. And a guy's like, I could just make up something real quick. But even that, like I've seen movies where I feel like that's the case. Robot Monster, I can... I, I've seen, and that feels like that is very much the case. But even in that, if there's someone just saying, I'm going to make this shit up as I go along, there's an energy behind that. There is an interest behind that, because at least there was a point to this movie being made. Right. You know, it doesn't have the the idea of we're going to take an, an older property and update it, or toy around with it, with modern conventions, or do like Kenneth Branagh's doing, and you know, rewrite the story so that there are, it's a more diverse cast and no, no nothing. That's none of that. Well, that's another thing. The guy's name is Nico, and he is white. All of the whole movie, I'm waiting for this like Hispanic guy to pop up, and he's a white guy. Like what? We you talking about Mexicans and oh, the racial slurs. <laughs> like I'm sorry, you you. There was no reason for these racial slurs to be happening. Like, yeah, I get the way that people talked back in the day, but, like, I don't think that they had to use those. I would agree. So. The, the only thing I can think of is it felt like they were trying to really, you mentioned it, they were trying to really draw attention to the fact that this is an older version of Marlowe than I think has been done. You know, he's constantly saying that he doesn't have a pension anymore. Yes. Oh, please. Let's add interest to the story. Let's start mentioning your lack of retirement money. Because <laughs> you know what? Finances. That's what will make this movie get better. <laughs> but I, so, so, I thought maybe they're like, okay, we want to tell a story of an older Marlowe. Okay, that's at least something. But they do nothing with it about, you know, the world changing. They certainly didn't change the age of his love interest. No. But she wasn't really even a love interest. Like, she was just kind of there. Yeah. They threw half-hearted innuendos back and forth, but you never got the then, feeling that they were going like, to end up together. Then you have, like, this woman commits this gruesome murder right in front of him, and he's just like, all right. Like, that's it. She doesn't get any trouble. She gets to, like, run a studio. That's fine. That's good. 
So what, what am I am I being led to believe that like I always thought that Marlo maybe he didn't play by the rules but he had his own moral code. Yeah, it's kind of like that that is true and they, they try to do that because he basically lets her have it so he can blackmail her into giving his friend a job. But But he didn't know that was gonna happen. No. Like Like, no, there's no way he would have known that ahead of time. This wasn't Ocean's twelve. This wasn't some kind of convoluted plot that actually made sense once you like you could trace the strings back. No. This is a guy who got drunk and accidentally figured something out, but actually it was the black chauffeur guy who figured it out. Yeah, he like had all the clues and was explaining it to him. So this is what happened and this happened. This is like so are you the detective? I don't know. Maybe this is actually like a precursor and this is gonna be all about Cedric now. You're saying that Cedric I watched a Cedric movie. He was the most interesting part of the whole show. <laughs> but still he just walked up and killed a guy for no reason. He didn't it wasn't no reason. He was a freaking yeah, he was a jackass. Alan but... Cummings was like a drug dealer, pimp, and he said he made Cedric the, the chauffeur do all sorts of terrible things, so he was just like, yeah, you know, fuck him. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I struggle to understand what the thought process was. I struggle to understand. I mean, when you consider how much money and time and energy a movie but... takes to make, well, and they had good names. This is, like I said with Queen Bees, when you have actors who are that talented, it has no business being a bad movie. Yeah. And you had talented actors who were just... Every one of them, Liam Neeson especially, felt like they they just woke up, you handed them the script, and they went, oh, okay, let's do this. Action. I can cold read better than that. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Like, I just... Like, uh, and that's the other thing. It just, I meant, it kind of goes along with what I was saying before, but it felt like nobody had any interest in this. No. That nobody involved cared. Yeah, not even the audience didn't have interest in it. Like, the people who made the movie weren't interested yeah. in making a good movie. They were just interested in being there. They were so, just like. I didn't know Danny Houston was still alive. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I guess what makes it worse is that there's been so many good detective movies. Yeah. Like the one we reviewed a couple of weeks ago, in a, in a Invitation to a Murder, that was great. Okay. Um, what was the one they did last year? Um, they did oh, the Knives Out one. Well, of course, the Knives Out ones are amazing. And they've just they, done another Kenneth Branagh Paul Rowe. Right. Is that, was it the, what was the one? The, then there were, the, was there, the, I can't remember. Um, there was another good detective one last year. Oh, too. the, uh, um, uh, see how they run. Yes. Yes, yeah, see how they run. So, like, we've gotten good detective movies lately, and I'm thinking maybe that makes this so much worse is that it's, you know, you didn't have to go far for this. This is an already an, an established character, and you just, like, I don't know, poor Bogey's spinning in his grave. I just, yeah, I don't. I don't understand what this was made for. I don't understand. Okay, this is the other thing. Okay, when I remember when when I first saw the trailer for the new, for the now, for the then new yeah. Murder on the Orient Express with Kenneth Branagh. Yeah. And I remember it was. I had the my gut reaction was, oh my god, are they remaking this again? Right. And then I kind of realized, well, they're remaking it for a younger audience. Right. To, to reintroduce the story to a new generation. You know, a character like Marlo would appeal to old-time fans like me. You know, nerds like that who love old radio shows and things. Or people like my parents for whom Philip Marlo was an established name. Right. Regular people, you know, everybody else, they have no idea who this person is. So right. this is your chance to reintroduce him into the lexicon and get him back into the conversation and maybe make him a viable character again reignite interest in the old books and movies and all this other stuff like the Kenneth Branagh films have and it just it it, it <laughs> sure as shit didn't do that no it did not uh, no it did not I mean yeah ever since the, the new murder on the Orient Express came out like I've seen like our community theaters doing an Agatha Christie mm -hmm. 
So I'm directing an act to Christy right now. So, like, it, and because the kids chose it, like, they wanted to do an Agatha, Agatha Christie. Yeah. So. So it's, it's, so this was their chance to do, to, to do that with this character. And just, again, it just felt like nobody involved cared. Or wanted to be there. It felt like every scene, the subject felt like, "Are we done yet?" Oh, it went on forever. Oh and I my didn't even god! Know that it was that long. I, I wouldn't be able to it tell was, you. It was it an felt, hour. It was an hour and forty-eight minutes. It felt interminable. Yes. Like. Like it was just never ending, and you're just like, God, please, this has to be. We're reaching a point in the movie where something has to happen. Yeah. And it didn't, and it never did. No. So I just, I just don't know what anyone was thinking, or why they wanted to do this, but they did it, and there it is. And so, should we even ask what is your? I, I, I don't, I don't give these out often, but I'm giving it, I'm giving it an F. Oh. I'm giving it an F. Usually, like, I, what will save a movie for me and why I won't give it an F or I'll move it up to a D or something like that is if there's something in it that I could see could have been better, if there was a spark or a good scene or an interesting character dynamic or anything like that, I'll, I'll bump a movie up a little bit, like I did for Oppenheimer. Like, I respected the filmmaking that went into it, even if it was long, pompous, and ultimately boring, but I still respected it as a filmmaking uh, tool. This, I got, I, there was nothing, there is nothing to recommend, not an interesting performance, not an interesting take on the character, there, it is a waste of fucking time. It is. Um, I'm going to go D minus. Okay. Because uh, I like the costumes. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's not as bad as Queen Bee's. <laughs> that is still your benchmark. It is. That is still your measuring stick for bad movies. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't finish the movie I rate and, like, wanting to, to punch a pillow. You just wanted to sleep. Basically. Yeah. So, anyways. Uh, so, yeah, D minus for me. Don't, 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 don't even try. Skip don't waste this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go back and watch Knives Out again. Yeah, so, all right. Well, there you go. Well, like I said at the intro, you said we needed to see more bad movies. We did. And we have, so uh, there you go. <laughs> and the next one, we'll, we'll, we're still trying to figure yeah, out the next what's one, good or bad. <laughs> yeah, the next one we don't know yet. We'll, we'll, uh, we've will we watched it. We just got to review it and go, what was that now? <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, but uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for putting up with a boring movie with me, my love. Even Anytime. You even just gives us an excuse to make out. A amen movie. to that. You, <laughs> you can make even a bad, boring movie a uh, good time. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, thanks for coming along. Thanks for joining us. Join us next time. And as always, drive safe, and we will see you at the movies.